Kid, seriously. Welcome to the latest edition of the AAF Update with me, Maya Madrid, where we take you through all the scores and analysis of your favorite startup spring football league. It's the AAF. Shout out to my main man, Luke Neitzel of MRA Ross Studios and uh, Kid Seriously for being willing to record and edit this podcast. Now, Luke, tonight I'm going to switch things up on you just a little bit. I want to take advantage of your position within the AAF landscape. You are a novice. You haven't watched a game. And so I've been dying to get your opinion all week as an outsider on the biggest news in the young history of your favorite league. Well, not your favorite league, but mine. Uh, this week, Carolina Hurricanes owner, who you are at least somewhat familiar with, Tom Dundon, made an incremental $250 million investment in the league. And I wanted to ask you what your opinion was when you first heard the news about this move, because I figure it could be different than mine. So what did you think when the news came out? Well, I didn't know that they had money problems, and I don't know if anyone did know that they had money problems, because the initial news I saw on Twitter was that they were really impressed with the the ratings and attendance was okay, though there's a couple stadiums they're worried about where they aren't getting very many people. And then that news came out, and it sounded like if he hadn't done that, they wouldn't have been able to pay players come week two. So that, at first, is very alarming and very shocking, because they're not very far into this. So to think that in week two they might be missing paychecks is pretty alarming and pretty startling. But the fact that they apparently had people in place that were willing to step in with deep pockets to finance the league is a pretty reassuring fact. It means that people who are able to keep it afloat during rough times believe in it and want to support it. And I'm a very big MLS fan. I'm a very big soccer fan. Major League Soccer was in the same boat where it almost folded not long after its existence. And basically Phil Anschultz and uh, the Hunt family kept the league alive and owned almost all the teams as they pushed it through. And now look where it is. So if they can continue to draw some investors that believe in football and believe in that, I, I think the big takeaway from this is that there's people with the in the right places that want this league to succeed. Well, your opinion is, is somewhat similar to mine. I, you know, there's all this thing about making the payroll and where everything stood. And obviously, when I first heard it, I had the same feeling like, oh, my goodness, if they can't make payroll after the first week, like what is going on? And so I was trying to get as much information as I could about what was really going on. And so I watched um, the Charlie Ebersol interview with Rich Eisen. And basically he said, and this is depending on if you're willing to believe him, because obviously he is biased in trying to sell the league. He said that the reason that the players didn't get paid was not because they were out of money. It's because they were switching payroll companies. And it somehow it was, it was better for the health insurance. So that's why they made the switch. They got a better health insurance deal going through a certain payroll company. And he said he wished he would have done it two weeks earlier because it was the delay and not necessarily not having the funds, but that the whole thing was like a giant clerical mistake, and it looked really bad, and he admitted that it looked really bad, but he was, he, you know, he, he was adamant that they weren't going to miss payroll for that second week. But if you listen to one of my favorite coaches in the league, Steve, my favorite coach in the league, Steve Spurrier, he was on a Orlando talk show, and he had said that one of the large original investors – actually pulled out of the league super early or, or like, I mean, super late in the deal. And so that kind of set everything sort of crazy. And he, he was saying that, that he made it sound like that was the reason for the delay. So that got me wondering, was that the reason that Brad Childress pulled it and that Michael Vick sort of bought it? And I know Michael Vick still works for the legends, but is that the reason those guys bailed so close to the end of the season? Now, if you listen to Chile, Chile said that it was a family decision, but even as he was doing that, He's also in the running to be the offensive coordinator with the Cleveland Browns if Stefanski had gotten the job. So it was like, like sometimes I care about my family and sometimes I don't care about my family. And, and, I, and I think if he had stayed with Atlanta and then gotten the job as the OC of the Browns, like no one would have blamed him. Like if the entire point of the league is to get guys promoted to the NFL, which is what the AAF is is selling and what is what people are buying. And it's what why people who watch the league really like it is like the sort of like, no, we're trying to get you to the NFL. I think had Chile done that, everybody would have understood and everybody would have been cool with it. 
So the question is, is like, why did he bail if he was trying to become the OC of the Browns as well? Because it wasn't about family. Was it about this money issue? Now, we get to Dundon's $250 million investment. I was doing a little math, right? The, kid, the players make about 80K a year. Or players make 80000 a year over the course of three years. If you m- multiply that by the amount of players, you get about 32 to $34 million depending on how many players per, you know, like you get some in and out and that sort of thing. It doesn't count for the coaches. It doesn't account for the 1,200 employees of the AAF. So maybe you increase that to about $50 million, right? That's still five years of payroll without a cent, without talking about any of the money deals, without talking about any tickets sold, without any talking about any concessions, any sponsorships, any of that. And so part of me kind of believe, like Ebersol says, like Dundon basically came in and gave him the godfather offer. said, look, you have, you know, Series A paid for, you have Series B paid for, you have Series C paid for. He said, and this is a quote from Ebersol, he said, what if I gave you Series Infinity? You never had to worry about money again. And he in Ebersol basically said that's the reason that he went with Dundon because Dundon basically just gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. So I don't know. I don't know what to believe. I don't know how close they were to actually failing. But here's what I do know is that there have been scouts from any every NFL team at every AAF game so far. And the the league seem the NFL really seems to be buying into the AAF, which is what I think they need. It's not this contentious relationship like the XFL was excuse me <clears throat> that the XFL was and that the XFL is setting them up to be the difference of the contracts with the XFL is you're not going to be able to have an out to go to the NFL and so they're once again like setting up their league in opposition to the NFL which I don't think is smart that's why I think the AAF long term and I think it'll be here next year uh, with this investment I think this is going to single signal a lot more sponsorships And so my hope is just like you said, with like the MLS as a blueprint of keeping the league sustainable until it can start making money on its own. So I don't know. Obviously, we're going to keep monitoring this as it keeps going, but I don't know what to make uh, so far. So let's go ahead and get to the games from week three while we review those. Uh, Salt Lake versus the Hot Shots. I've been telling anyone that will listen that Salt Lake was not a bad football team and that they would give the hot shots a run for their money, which was probably the craziest hot take that I had in last week at week's episode. Uh, Arizona was the second best team in the league, and their offense was just beating down everybody. Um, and so on the opposite side, the Stallions had played tough, but they were 0-2. And so it looked like a huge mismatch, but not so fast because Josh Woodrum, the uh, Salt Lake quarterback, was back in the lineup. And it really seemed like he was just what they needed. They jumped out to an early lead with a touchdown and a field goal. And then at the half, the score was uh, – I'm sorry, before half, the hot shots came back in the second quarter. They got their own touchdown, got their own field goal, tied it up 9-9. Right as the third quarter started, uh, the the second-best quarterback in the league, in my opinion, John Wolford, the quarterback of the hot shots, did the double whammy. He threw a pick, and as he did that, he also injured his back as he got slammed to the ground. You know, the Stallions, who have been having problems with their quarterback injuries, now the shoe is on the other foot. And even though uh, even though it was pretty close at the beginning, and even though Trevor Knight didn't play, like, really badly and kind of still moved the ball, and he's got some limitations, we'll talk about that later, the Stallions were scoring touchdowns, the hot shots were scoring field goals, and the Stallions ended up pulling it through to win to go up or win their first game of the season. So uh, the final was Salt Lake 23, Arizona 15. The second game on Saturday was another weird game. Orlando struggled against Memphis. It looked like the Apollos were going to get blown or were going to blow the doors off the Express, I should say. Uh, they had an interception and a touchdown in like the first two plays. But afterwards, the defense for the Express really hunkered down and they stifled Spurrier's offense in a way that so far, nobody's been able to do. Their their defensive backfield coverage was absolutely ma- amazing. Unfortunately, however, for Memphis, they were playing Christian Hackenberg at quarterback, and that dude is still awful. He was awful at Penn State. He was awful as a second-round pick for the Jets. He's still bad. And they didn't put in a uh, terrible person, Zach Medenberger, until way too late, and he kind of uh, led them on two drives and looked pretty impressive. Um, but Orlando outlasted them 21-17. to Even though Orlando looked awful, they were still the better team, and I think that might be the hallmark of a really good team. 
Game number three, my Birmingham Iron traveled to Atlanta, who is the worst dumpster fire in the league. In short, the Iron are who we thought they were. They're a tough defensive team, and the Iron Curtain ended up with four turnovers and have been taking the ball away uh, pretty much all year, just getting turnover after turnover. Meanwhile, the Legends, also who we thought they were, uh, they can't run the ball. They can't pass the ball without turning it over. Sims, uh, the son of uh, Phil Sims, brother of Chris Sims, he threw the ball for more yards, but he still turned it over like four times. Um, so they are winless still. They lose 28-12. to 12. They really, really, I mean, it's Aaron Murray time. This is just ridiculous. And I don't know how much you know about SEC football, but Aaron Murray was one of the great SEC quarterbacks for Georgia, and he was the pick to be the starter. And for some reason, they're starting Matt Sims, which either means one of two things. The coaching is really bad, or Aaron Murray is really bad. I don't know which one is which, but I do know that Atlanta is very bad. The final game of the week was the, probably the most shocking. I was really right about Salt Lake. I told you about that last week, that I thought they were a good football team. And I was right about Atlanta. I told you that they were a bad football team. But I was wrong about San Diego. Holy crap. The commanders from San Antonio came to California to take on Marcus's men, and something snapped in the fleet. Ever since they put in your guy, Philip Nelson, obviously another. Do you know about him? This is the guy. He was at Minnesota, and then there was the bar fight. Oh, and yeah, I do know him. Guy. Yeah. Okay. So that's their quarterback. Now, as soon as they put him in, they have been – he's not that great, okay? He's not, like, lighting it up, but he's playing just good enough to prevent them from bringing another guy towards the box. You can't bring him in the box in the league because of the blitzing rules. But that has totally opened up their running game. Uh, Jaquan Gardner had an 83-yard touchdown and had 122 yards overall. And then their other running back, Terrell Watson, had 73 more yards. And so, like, Nelson's doing just enough to make them super explosive. And they kick the crap out of San Antonio. Now, San Antonio, I think, is a much better team than 31-11. to 11, But I thought, I thought San Diego was going to be awful. And now, look, we're three weeks in. San Diego is 2-1. and one. Granted, one of those wins was against Atlanta. And everybody, I, Atlanta might go 0-10 this year. I don't know. But, like, look out for Mike Martz. Like, he, he learned his lesson, apparently, and is running the football. So, Luke, I'm going to start a new thing. I'm going to do Maya's picks here where I pick the games because I feel like if I'm going to talk trash about all the things that I called, I might as well put it on the line here. So, this week, game number one is San Diego at Memphis. I think it's no surprise here. I'm going to go with San Diego because Memphis is winless. And even though I don't – I still think San Diego is kind of suspect. I'm going to pick them on the road, even though it's in bad weather, or at least colder weather. Game number two, we got Orlando at Salt Lake. Undefeated Orlando at 1-2 and two Salt Lake. This is my upset pick. I'm going to go Salt Lake here. I think Orlando is going to have difficulty in the cold weather and the altitude, and I also think that Salt Lake is just hitting their stride here in their second home game. Uh, their defense with, with Connor Schultz is amazing. Their quarterback is back. They're moving the ball. So I'm looking for the upset there. The the game on Sunday, the early game on Sunday, is San Antonio at Birmingham. Birmingham is my team, and San Antonio looked very bad last week. San Antonio has to go on the road again. So I'm going to pick Birmingham uh, to win. That's going with the chalk here. And then the nightcap in what could be a very, very ugly. Atlanta travels all the way across the country to Arizona. This is really going to be on if Arizona's quarterback, Wolfie, is is healthy. If he is, Atlanta's going to blow him out. Or, I'm sorry, Arizona's going to blow him out. If he's not healthy, then Atlanta or uh, Arizona's still going to win. Atlanta will, will lose this game no matter who's quarterback. I'm not going to say I could be quarterback, but the list is long of dudes who could quarterback uh, Arizona to victory over Atlanta. So, without further ado, we're going to do our rankings. Are you ready? Do it. All right. So, number eight. Atlanta, still bad, 0-3. Like I said, they need to change from Matt, Sim, or Matt Sims to Aaron Murray, and they should have done it three weeks ago. Okay, They have been garbage. Number seven, Memphis Express, led by Mike Singletary, 0-3. And, and they're going to get a little bit of a bounce because of Mettenberger. And you may not know about Mettenberger, but he was the guy at LSU who like sexually harassed people in a bar and got kicked off of the Georgia team. So... Uh, another real winner there. So they're easy to root against. Um, but at least for Memphis, they got rid of Hackenberg. So as much as I burger, it was probably the right choice. 
Uh, it wasn't probably. It was the right choice. Number six and fading fast. San Antonio now one and two. I thought these guys were better than what they showed, and they got just pummeled. I don't know if it's like a home field advantage thing. San Antonio has the highest attendance, and everybody talks about how their fans are the best fans in the league. But, man, they got the crap kicked out of them by San Diego. Number five, two and one, San Diego. This is where my picks get a little saucy because I picked San Diego, who's two and one, and technically tied for first place in the West. Uh, they look like they're a hot team, and maybe they're putting it all together, but I haven't seen them go against Orlando's run defense, and I haven't seen them go against Birmingham's run defense. And so until they do that, I'm not going to rank them too much higher. But I will say this. I had them at seven last week, so they have gone up the charts. Uh, number four, Salt Lake is one and two. Now, I said last week, and I'll say it again, I think this is a playoff team. I think the altitude and the cold weather is going to help them, and I think their defense is really good. That quarterback coming back, Woodrum, is going to be really good for them. And I think they're going to beat Arizona, even if, if uh, Wolford would have stayed the whole game. I think they still win that game. Because it was 9-9, to but they were moving the ball. They had the home field advantage. And Wolford th- threw that pick, um, you know, technically before he was injured. So I, I think it really would have been Salt Lake's game. Number three, though, is Arizona 2-1. and one. A lot is going to, like I said, it's going to depend on how hurt Wolford is. I don't think it's I don't think his injury is bad, but I haven't seen a injury report on him yet. His backup is Trevor Knight from Oklahoma, and he can't pass the ball. Like, he, he is inaccurate as heck. So, uh, right now, they're ahead of Salt Lake, but if Wolford's out, they're going to drop, and Salt Lake, I think, is going to take control from uh, San Diego and from Arizona. That leaves number two. Birmingham is 3-0. Luis Perez, he's looked solid, but he has, like, he looked good in the first half in week one, and he's just been kind of, like, game managing it, game managing it, game managing it. Like, And he just hasn't turned the ball. He threw one pick, and he turned the ball over once this year. They play really good defense. They have nine turnovers so far this year, so they're averaging three takeaways a game. They play great special teams. Like, it's – they're not they're not pretty. They're just, like, gritty, and they just, like – they just find a way to win every week. Now, they look great against Atlanta. Everybody looks great against Atlanta, but, like, they just – they just do the little things, and I think they're really, really well coached. But that leaves number one. It's Steve Spurrier's Orlando. To be the man, you got to beat the man. And no one has beaten Steve Spurrier yet in this league. I know they didn't play well against Memphis, but guess what? When you play your worst game and still take it to a team on the road, you're a good football team. So until anybody takes the throne from Spurrier, he's going to be at the top of my list because uh, – He's just so damn fun to watch, man. So with that, it's the Alliance update with Maya Madrid. For uh, for now, we'll see you next week.